law enforcement and methamphetamine, truly on the firing line. Sheriff Sue Rohr, right here on Public Exposure, I'm Stan Emmert. And uh, before we get to the meth issue, Sheriff, and welcome to the show, mm -hmm. got to ask you about the bikers. Yes. Are you guys out to get the bikers? Absolutely not. This, is, this was a, an unfortunate situation all the way around. And, mm -hmm. and, and for our public that's hearing about this for the first time, the, um, there was an incident of a group called, is it Critical Mass? Mm -hmm. is that what they, they are um, a group of bikers who, um, not, bicyclists, yeah, bicyclists mm -hmm. who um, have views apparently that they have more rights on the road perhaps than others. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair way to put it? Well, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know what their agenda is. I just know that some of our deputies came across a, a person who was illegally blocking an intersection and the deputy took his appropriate law enforcement action and it turned out that he had literally walked into one of their demonstrations. A hornet's nest, a bicyclist. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, let's So it was unfortunate, but sometimes these things happen. All right, well, we'll keep following the news okay. for that story. Thanks. Um, I just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions or comments for the sheriff, go to the website. Uh, it's metrokc.gov slash sheriff. Right there it is up on the screen. Lots of information about lots of topics. Tonight's topic, however, however, is meth. Mm -hmm. And it is something that in your many years in law enforcement, you've dealt with for quite some time. Correct. Meth in my law enforcement career is pretty long. I go back 27 years. But I would say in the, in the past five years at least, meth has emerged as one of our major law enforcement issues. It's a major public safety issue, and it's a major health issue in the community. Well, it has been a focal point of the Attorney General here in the state, mm -hmm. and in fact, if we could go to the, uh, to the next slide, because meth impact mm -hmm. is amazing, just the statistics. Uh, in Washington, fewer than 30% of meth-addicted parents regain custody of their children. Next one is meth using parents. Uh, have uh, helped drive a, uh, if we can go to the next, yeah, here we have drive a 62% increase in the foster care population in the past decade. And in two counties here in, in the state, mm -hmm. um, Benton and Franklin, 160 of the 250 kids in foster care are there because their parents use meth. Have you had to deal with this? We have, and I think this is one of the, there are so many problems that that emerge from the use of methamphetamine. I think this is the most critical problem though, is children are being endangered because parents are using methamphetamine. The, the combination of the horrific poor hygiene that the children are living in, as well as the neglect from the parents, put the children at, at real risk. If there's a lab in the home, then the children are literally being poisoned every day that they're living in that home where meth is being manufactured. And later on in the show, we're going to have a, mm -hmm. a clip of what uh, your officers go through right. when they go into a meth lab. And so we'll, we'll just wait to, to okay. see that. Uh, King County Council back in uh, August of 2005 passed some legislation empowering communities to combat meth. And specifically, they gave you powers. They said they, mm -hmm. and, and, but they talked about you. The sheriff's office reports that meth labs are primarily found in the rural communities of South King County, primarily Enum, Plum, Maple Valley, and Covington, although they are increasingly found in urban areas as well. Mm -hmm. Where do you find meth labs? We, our, our experience has been most meth labs are in the more rural areas because it's easier to conceal the activity. But that's not to say they don't occur other places. We find them in, in suburban areas. We find them in, in hotels and motels. We find uh, small meth labs in the trunks of cars. Really? Mm -hmm. So very mobile, huh? It's a very, it's a very mobile situation. Often we'll find a small camping trailer or a type of trailer abandoned up a dirt road and there'll be a meth lab in there. The, the reason it's more common out in the rural areas, again, it's easier to conceal the activity that's going on if neighbors are 500 yards apart rather than 50 feet apart. Hmm. Well, uh, in fact, the state created a task force mm -hmm. uh, tied to meth, and uh, Sheriff uh, Rohr is on there uh, representing the Washington Association of... Um, Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Mm -hmm. And part of this, there was a report that came out. It was, mm -hmm. I think it's called the uh, Allied Against Meth, is that yes, right? Yes, Operation Allied Against Meth. Mm -hmm. And the task uh, force report from 2005 had several recommendations or several findings in it. Right. Talked about specialized prosecution. What is that about? 
Well, there's, we have to approach meth in a, in a particular way, especially when you're dealing with dependency cases for children. Mm -hmm. um, we developed a protocol that was adopted by the state for dealing with children who are, being, um, who are living in a meth-affected environment. When our deputies go to a home where meth is being manufactured and there's children present, the children are taken into protective custody and there's protocols that are followed to make sure that we gather all the information that we need to have a successful dependency case if that is necessary. What we find... If that is necessary? <coughs> I mean, it, my it, goodness, if there's a child in a meth lab, then, mm -hmm. then the parents just need to be out of there. Well, you and I might think so, but when you go through the court system, you have to show evidence. And if, okay. we, can, if we can establish that there are toxic levels of these chemicals in the system of these children, it enhances the case. Okay. Um, one of the other recommendations relates to cross-county boundaries. They're mm -hmm. basically kind of getting rid of, the, uh, of, of your limitations sometimes? Well, what we're doing, we're doing a lot more work across jurisdictions because as with any drug trade, meth is really not that different that way. The, the people who are distributing and manufacturing drugs don't pay any attention to the boundaries. And so we make an extra effort to make sure that we're, we're sharing information, we're working cooperatively on investigations. Another part of the state task force report, uh, the Operation Allied Against Meth, uh, was for clandestine labs. Mm -hmm. is, is that that you guys are going to set up bogus labs or that? No, actually what they, they're, they're referring to the meth labs as clandestine labs. Oh, I see. Because these are labs that, that are hidden away. And um, there is a particular approach that needs to be used to get into the labs. You know, you'll probably be showing pictures where the, the detectives are wearing full protective gear to go into the labs. And there's a whole protocol that's followed when they go into what we call take down a lab mm -hmm. to dismantle okay. it, to gather evidence and that sort of thing. And then another part of the task force mm -hmm. report relates to related crimes. It seems like this mm -hmm. is viral. Exactly. I'd, and I think the, the thing that makes the meth problem, in my opinion, so much more serious than some of our other drug abuse issues is we have found so many of our crimes that are going up, our property crimes involving auto theft, identity theft, and that related fraud, the majority of those cases can be tracked back to methamphetamine. Really? Many, the people that use methamphetamine um, are very <coughs> desperate. And they are used like an army by organized crime folks. They, they'll take a meth user who will go out, steal a car, drive around a neighborhood, and steal mail out of mailboxes, and take the proceeds of the day to their meth dealer. And what we started discovering several years back is we would recover stolen cars, and they're full of stolen mail. And these, these things all end up relating back to the methamphetamine trade. Mm. Well, we've talked about the labs. Let's mm -hmm. let's talk with the public about, you know, what a lab could look like even in mm -hmm. their own in their own neighborhood. There's a website. It's called uh, reportofmethlab.com. It has some really good information mm -hmm. on it. And um, unusually strong odors is one of the telltale signs. What are you What are you talking about there? Well, it's I find it difficult to describe a particular <laughs> smell, but what what I tell people is if you smell a strong chemical type odor you should report that to local law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different, very toxic chemicals that are used, and most often that's how we find out about a lab, is a smell. Um, another uh, telltale sign is residences with windows blacked out or mm -hmm. a lot of curtains or blankets over the windows. Correct. And again, they're, what they're trying to do is hide from people outside, hide, hide their activities that are going on inside. Mm -hmm. Most people will open their drapes occasionally. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, another telltale sign is large amounts of traffic. Um, mm -hmm. And I find this kind of interesting. It would seem that if you were going to engage in, in this crime, which mm -hmm. is you know, creating meth, that you'd kind of want not, not to let a whole lot of people know. Well, and, but, but what happens is they manufacture, many of these, these manufacturers sell right out of where they're manufacturing it. And so people are coming and going all the time to pick up the product. And it's very um, common to have a high level of traffic. And when neighbors call and report to us that, A, they have a strong chemical smell or there's a lot of in and out traffic, those two things really will indicate to us that there probably is something going on there. Another sign is excessive trash. And in the video that we're going to show, basically most of the video was just excessive trash everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, 
I didn't find that interesting, but that's a telltale sign. How come? Well, I, I don't. You know, I don't know if I can um, explain the psychological <laughs> impact of meth, but. The meth labs that we come across, they exist in the most filthy environments you can imagine. And people who are highly addicted to meth, their entire focus is on getting the next batch of the drug. And so they don't, they don't take care of anything around them. And if you think about you know, responsible citizens that go through their day, they take the trash out. They do those sorts of things. People who are on meth and manufacturing meth they don't do those things. Their entire focus is on their drug addiction. Hmm. And then uh, finally, the, another sign is uh, unusual quantities of clear glass containers. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, they're, <coughs> they're using the glass containers in the chemical process of making the methamphetamine. Often you'll see glassware, you'll see tubing, um, you'll see there's various precursor chemicals. Um, heat, it's called. The, the, there's different chemicals that you can buy in the local auto parts store. Um, all sorts of common things like that. Chemicals in the auto parts store the, that you use to create meth and then people put that in their bodies? Oh yes, you, you can't believe some of the chemicals. Anhydrous ammonia, there's a lot of things that are very toxic that are used in the process of manufacturing meth. I believe this is one of the reasons when you look at um, the brain scans of people who have been using meth, or you look at just at the physical degradation of their bodies, um, I'm not a doctor, but I think common sense tells you that there is an impact that those toxic chemicals have over time. Wow. Are we ready with the first video clip? If we are, we'd like to go to that, and we're not going to have any sound on during the clip, Sheriff. And if you could okay. talk us through. This is uh, the, the first <coughs> clip uh, comes from um, actually Snohomish County, and we thank uh, Snohomish County for bringing this to us. Um, but uh, essentially, yeah, here we are right now. Here, well, here's the excessive trash. Exactly. And again, and, you and have can we pause, right? I uh -huh. wanted to ask the, the studio uh, to pause if you could, because here we are. We're looking at a bunch of needles. Is that the way it's done? Some people inject it. You can smoke it. You can inject it. You can eat it. You can snort it. There's a lot of different ways to mm. ingest methamphetamine. All right. So because of that, you and, and we are, we're going to go away and we'll come back to the video in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but basically, there's so many different ways to get it into your body, but mm -hmm. needles is one that, I mean, there are a lot of needles there. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I don't know what the numbers are, what percentage of people use needles versus other methods of, of ingesting it, but certainly needles are a quick way of getting the hygiene. And, and then since we already have hygiene issues, and then no oh. doubt there's likely to be dirty needles. And, Absolutely. And, you know, goodness knows what's... Exactly. Okay. If they're taking such poor care of everything else, I can guarantee they're not using clean needles every All time. right, we, we got to take a break. Just want to remind everyone we're talking with Sheriff Sue Rohr tonight, who is truly right on the firing line every day with, with she and her staff. And the battle against meth, it is not just that it is an illegal drug, but it the so many different related activities that surround meth. Uh, it's just a very, very difficult social, criminal, cultural problem that we have here uh, today. If you want more information, go to the website metrokc.gov slash sheriff, metrokc.gov slash sheriff. You talked before about the physical degradation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and uh, PBS did a Frontline special, mm -hmm. I think it was last year, from Oregon. And they actually showed some of the people and their before and after pictures. And if we can get those up, here's the before uh -huh. picture of normal looking people mm -hmm. and then after Six, as, as little as six month use of meth, they've got open sores in their faces and mm -hmm. their whole physical physiques just change. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, again, I think it's, pro it's the impact of the toxic chemicals that are used in the manufacture of methamphetamine. Um, you'll notice, and it's something that we see often in people who use, have used meth for a long time, is their teeth begin to rot out. And again, there's a chemical relationship. I can't uh, explain that process to you. But it's a combination of the chemical impact on their bodies as well as the extraordinarily poor hygiene and the, the filth that many of these people live in. Hmm. I mean, just a person not using meth living in that kind of a situation is going to get sick to some degree just because of the poor hygiene. Well, let's go uh, mm -hmm. to an article. This was from April of this year from uh, Northwest News. There was wide support for sheriff mm -hmm. at a public meeting, but here was the thing. A man from Duval said that getting rid of meth labs was like swatting flies. As soon as they're shut down in one place, they move to another. 
He asked what the sheriff's office was doing about the meth problem, and she said, you, Sheriff mm -hmm. Rohr, received $2 million from the federal government for meth task forces, and she hoped to get $4 million next year. First off, Sheriff, mm -hmm. um, we're going to, well, let's go to the rest of the quote, and we'll, go, we'll take these in two different ways. Okay. One, she also said there was a growing trend to use jails for mentally ill and the drug dependent, and using jails in this way doesn't deal with the treatment issues. So let's go mm -hmm. to the $2 million versus the $4 million federal dollars. Right. Okay, so you get the money. What do you use it? What do you well, do with it? We, it? What we're doing through the, um, the use of our, we have meth action teams in counties across Washington State. What we have come to understand is it doesn't work to just take an enforcement approach or just take a treatment approach, or, but not take, not take any thought about housing or jobs or anything else. <clears throat> so what we've done is we've used this money to bring people together from across all these different disciplines and coordinate what we're doing so that, we, so that we have things like drug courts where people who are serious meth addicts, if you just put them in jail for a couple of years, as soon as they get out, they're going to go right back into using meth again. Uh, and so the thought is use, use the threat of jail as the hammer to get them to go through treatment. Treatment is not easy and it's not pleasant. And without that hammer, a lot of people won't go into it. We had a healthcare professional on the show several weeks ago who's, mm -hmm. who basically said that treatment for meth is almost impossible. You know, I would have to disagree with that because I have met a lot of meth recovered meth addicts. It's certainly not easy. It's a very difficult addiction to overcome. What I have seen make a difference is if the person who is on meth and really does want to get off, if they have a strong support system around them, they have a much better chance of getting off meth. Unfortunately, the lifestyle of a meth addict is so destructive that they tend to destroy all their relationships and all their support systems. So by the time they get to the point where they're ready for treatment, they have no support system left. So I guess I would say there's a number of families who discover they have a meth addict in the family. I would say to the family, stick with them because mm. that support system is going to make the difference whether or not this person overcomes the addiction. We're going to go back to the video, and as that's being mm -hmm. queued up, uh, you did have an opportunity to um, meet someone at a KCTS interview that you yes. did yes. who had recovered. Correct. And. I mean, it was an amazing recovery based on what you said. Well, it was because there, there's always going to be individual variation in how people react to different things. And meth is a devastating addiction, but I don't want to put out the message that you can't get over it or that you're permanently damaged because I have met recovered meth addicts who actually look healthy, act healthy, and they are now you know, having productive, healthy lives. Unfortunately, I think those are probably there's probably a smaller percentage in that category. But a big part of it, though, as you said, was it's related. It's the support system. The support system. Absolutely. So, are we ready to go back to the video? Just go ahead and here we are. Mm -hmm. This is from another meth lab. Mm -hmm. So, describe to us what you see. And well, again, what you're seeing is a is just a horrible environment. There's some of the glass. There's the containers. glass where they have they have to raise it. They have to cook it. They have to reach a certain temperature to actually have the chemical processes mm. And they would use their ovens as well? Just about anything they can to heat up the chemicals. More, it's more typical to see the glassware sitting on top of a hot plate. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a coffee pot there. Exactly. I, I think it is, anyway. Yeah. Here again we're seeing it's just the, a mess. The, 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 <laughs> tube, the tubing and the glassware, I think, oh. are, are real common things to find in, in these situations. The anhydrous mm -hmm. ammonia, the acetone, um, just all these different chemicals. Now these are common chemicals, aren't they? Absolutely, and one of the I mean, reasons... This is a fertilizer. Yes, one of the reasons that the, the meth labs became so prolific is the precursor chemicals were available in any, any store that, that people go into. One of the most successful things we've done to reduce the number of meth labs... Yeah, and if we can pause it just for a second. Sure. What is that chemical in the... In the uh, well, just go ahead, but, but okay. what's that chemical that's in the... Uh, uh, the can likely to be the acetone. Oh, it's the acetone is one, and you find these these cans, um, and I'm blanking out on the the chemical, but it's called heat. You put it in your mm -hmm. gas tank oh, to yeah. get rid of the the moisture in your gas, and you often will see these cans laying around that they've been used. 
But what, what has helped us reduce the number of labs in Washington State and in, in King County particularly is the legislation that was passed that requires the products containing pseudoephedrine to be kept behind the counter. Because in order to, to manufacture the meth, they have to have the little pseudoephedrine tablets. What, what uh, meth addicts and meth manufacturers were doing is going into stores and mostly shoplifting. Usually they didn't buy the products, but mm -hmm. they would shoplift stacks and stacks of these pseudoephedrine products and then use those. Once those were taken away from the, where they're readily accessible, it became more and more difficult to manufacture the meth. And we really believe that that legislation and that control of that one particular precursor chemical had a very, very positive impact on reducing the number of meth labs. Mm. Can we go back to the video? Mm -hmm. And uh, because uh, here we are back at it again, again uh -huh. showing the, the meths, um, different types of containers. I don't exactly. And, and they, they'll manufacture it anywhere under the sun. I think we're going to pan to a toilet here. Yeah, there's here. a toilet. You know, <laughs> and I have seen this several times. And it just amazes mm -hmm. me at how filthy it is, especially when you see this fan. I wouldn't have it in a barn. Right, but the, like I said before, the sad thing is there are children living in these homes where these toxic chemicals are being brewed, and yeah. and you can see we don't allow our detectives to go into these homes unless they are completely covered in hazardous materials gear. So you'll have a detective that you won't let him go in in that, but then uh, he or she will go in and find children living yes. there? Yes, and, and I think the most heartbreaking thing I've ever seen at a meth lab scene is the, the detective in full gear with a self-contained breathing apparatus carrying a two-year-old out of the house mm -hmm. who has been living there, and I won't even let my detective go in there for 10 minutes and breathe in the toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. Well, what is the toxicity? Is it, I mean, the, every chemical that you've talked about mm -hmm. is a commonly purchased chemical. And, and of course, right. now there's the, the pseudoephedrine that is. Yeah, pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine, uh -huh. rather, that is, is not quite as common as it was. Right, right. The, 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 what, what creates the toxicity is mixing of the chemicals and heating them up. And so you take chemicals that, that alone are not toxic well, under some circumstances, they would be. But you put the chemicals together and you get the chemical reaction. Mm. I think most people that have been through high school chemistry you know, have been warned by their teacher, there are certain chemicals you don't put together because it will create a toxic gas. And that's exactly what we see happening in the process of cooking meth. Now, you have talked that there's some good news, and that mm -hmm. is that um, meth labs are, in, in terms of their number mm -hmm. and effectiveness, is on the way down that's here in correct. the state of Washington. Dramatically down. Um, but that there is still a lot of meth coming into the state from other sources. Exactly, and this is, this is the unfortunate side of a problem like methamphetamine addiction, and that is um, people who would profit and benefit from somebody else's addiction, they're going to find another way to provide the product. As long as there is a, is a, a, a need out there um, or a demand out there, they're going to find a way to get it. And so what they have discovered is they can purchase methamphetamine from super labs out of the country in Mexico and we're now finding a lot of imported meth coming into the United States and into the state of Washington in particular. So before what was primarily a local law enforcement mm -hmm. problem now has become an international problem. C correct and we, we've had to change our enforcement strategy. Before when the lab problem began to emerge we began focusing our resources at the local level really focusing on on small labs and most of the labs that we took down were, were not what you would call a, a super lab. Now that the labs are down we're seeing a lot of imported meth. We had a case where we found uh, 11 pounds of methamphetamine that had been abandoned at a construction site. What we believe is a drug deal went bad and somebody fled and left this behind but we're talking half a million dollars just abandoned on the street. So if somebody can abandon that much methamphetamine, that gives you an indication of how much more there is out there. Well, it is a very expensive problem. We've talked about mm -hmm. the human damage, but it's also mm -hmm. a very expensive problem. Uh, there's some other statistics. Publicly funded treatment programs in Washington saw a 9% increase in meth-related admissions in 2004. Look at any specific expenditure of government, and if it goes up that much in one year, mm -hmm. people are going to scream. Yes. And then 31 of 39 counties experienced an increase and public funded treatment. And then for every pound of meth produced, there are six pounds of toxic waste produced. And then the cost of cleaning up a meth 
a site can reach $150,000. Of course, that's all public expense. I don't expect so, that. Sometimes it is the individual landlord that ends up footing the bill really? for that. If you own a house and you're renting it to someone who has a meth lab in there, the landlord ends up responsible for paying for the damage. Well, what, so. I mean, can you... What can you do to clean it up? I mean, it, it's, it, there's a there's a pretty wide variation depending on the size of the lab, what types of chemicals were used. But it can be you know a couple thousand dollars to like you saw here up to 150 thousand or more. It just depends on how much they've been cooking, how long they've been cooking, how they have disposed of the byproducts, and that's that's a big issue with meth labs. Is like they said, for every pound you make, there's six pounds of toxic byproduct that has to be disposed of. Now, these are people that don't even take out their regular trash, oh, well. let alone their toxic chemical trash that's going to mm -hmm. be left on the property. Of course, the, the better way to go would, would be to be prevent the use exactly. ever. Absolutely. It, how can that be done? Well, I think there's, it's, it, the thing with methamphetamine, we have in the past been dealing with older users. It was more common for us to find meth addicts in their 20s and 30s. It was an older person. I mean, older person. Yeah. 20 doesn't sound older to me, but yeah. it was an older. It was a drug that people got into when they were older. It's sad that we're beginning to see younger people using it. We're seeing more females using it. A lot of females who use meth start using it for weight control, and they don't realize how addictive it is. So. Number one, it's very important to get out and educate the public and educate teenagers and young people about how addictive it is. We also need to educate, educate them about how damaging it is. If you look at brain scans of people mm -hmm. who have used meth, their brain looks like Swiss cheese. It's unbelievable the damage that's left behind. Well, that's Sheriff. Unfortunately, we have to go. Thank you very much, though, for being directly on the firing line and, and helping to prevent something that is just a very, very difficult problem for all of us. If you want more information, go to the website, www.metrokc.gov slash sheriff. We'll see you right here on Public Exposure next week.